are rising. The color line in the NFL begins to fade. In 1950s pro football, African Americans constantly broke new ground. Number 35, Paul Tank Younger, was the first athlete drafted from a historically black school. His college coach, Grambling's legendary Eddie Robinson, made just one request. There's one thing you have to do. And I said, well, what is that, coach? He said, you have to make it. He said, you've been voted the best black college football player in the country from a black school. You are not going to play for the Los Angeles Rams. And if you don't make it, they can always say, we took the best you had to offer, and he wasn't good enough. And in all likelihood, it may be years before another black guy get an opportunity. Despite the challenges, the 50s were a showcase of Hall of Fame performances by defensive standouts like Lynn Ford and Dick Knight Train Lane of the Cardinals, Rams, and Lions. Offensively, the role of the running back was redefined by men like number 33, Ali Matson, who was traded to the Rams for nine other players. I could be going down the sideline, the opening and the guys would be reaching. Uh, acceleration, that's one thing that people don't really realize, you know. You can accelerate so fast, and the guy think he's got you, and he's just grabbing air. Now you see me, and now you don't. John Henry Johnson and number 34, Joe the Jet Perry, were one half of San Francisco's legendary million-dollar backfield. If either one of us were to touch the ball, we figured we could score from anywhere on the field because no one could set their bearings on, on one person in particular because they never knew where we were going to hit them from. While Perry soared, John Henry Johnson's running and blocking style matched an era of hardened men in a brutal game. If you were running back, if you were a good running back, and you're a threat to them, they take extra things trying to punish you, trying to scare you, trying to intimidate you. So you have to protect yourself and fight back, you know. Well, I just get in a little crouch, you know, and uh, just get in that little crouch and be waiting when they get in position. I sprint up at them like this, you know. So I kind of pop them off the feet a lot of time. Slowly, during the 50s, the color lines on the field began to fade. John Henry Johnson was very tough as a great runner and, and a blocker. And I remember I was returning a, a punt, and uh, I ran out of bounds, and John Henry just came on out of bounds still. This is black on black, you know, and pow! And one of the white guys on my team ran over and started calling them names. John Henry, you black so-and-so, and called him a nigga. And then reached out and grabbed me, said, come on, Bobby, let's go. You see? <laughs> John Henry was a nigga in that point, but I was not. Once you played, with the white guys on your team, I mean, you were accepted on the field, really, by them, and they protected you and you protected them as all part of the game for your team. While there was progress for black players elsewhere in the league, in the nation's capital, the Redskins owner, George Preston Marshall, made segregation's last stand. He said, we're gonna start playing black players when the Harlem Globetrotters start playing white players. By 1962, it had become a political event. Even Congress pressured Marshall to integrate. But it was only after consecutive seasons in which the Redskins won only one game that Marshall finally relented. He traded for Bobby Mitchell. We break camp, we come into Washington and have the welcome home luncheon. I'm standing there and everybody stands up. And the shock for me was they started singing uh, uh, Dixie. And I'm standing there, and I'm looking around, and everybody just singing their hearts out. And George Preston Marshall was on the next, put him down from me. And he turned around, he looked up at me, and he said, Bobby Mitchell, sing! This is loud. And I just started to mouth. <laughs> I didn't even know the words. Mitchell rose above the insults, and his Hall of Fame talent and grace helped restore the Redskins to respectability. And while all of the teams were integrated, many more challenges lay ahead for the Black Star Rising.
We moved from the struggle for access to the struggle for dignity in the 1960s, uh, the struggle for respect. What is so different with me than my counterparts? When I see they can go anywhere they want, they can do whatever they want to do, and everything is okay. Now, I can't go anywhere that I want to go. I can't do what I see them doing. So therefore, there are differences. Yet, basically, we are still supposed to be the same. And uh, that takes points off. It drains you. You think about this. You, you know, you, you, you concern yourself about uh, something that bigger than you can deal with because you can't overcome it. And then you have to hit the field 100% and get ready and perform to top performance. I think every, every black player during that period of time was cognizant of it. The problem that we had was, was, was the fear that was instilled in their minds in their own hometowns by, by their own local people. I had been humiliated all my life. Humiliation is, is, uh, is going to a segregated school walking past five upscale white schools and going to the little old black two-room shack down the street. That's humiliation. It made you believe that uh, you were less than a man. So you're constantly trying to prove yourself as a human being. And See, when you came up in the NFL, you thought that some of that would cease. But, you know, you came up here and you found that um, it was no different. And so now the, the deal had to be settled between the lines, and thank God for that. <laughs> In the 1960s, the black athlete in the NFL proved that he didn't need much more than a chance. Give me 18 inches of daylight. That's all I need. We had to be better than anybody else just to perform, just to have this vehicle to display our talents. We had to be better than anybody else. That has some good in it. That has some bad in it. The bad being that you feel like you've got to overachieve. The good is that it takes you to your highest potential. But we knew that uh, that if we made a team, that we, that we were, you know, that we were really good, that we were a uh, superior athlete, uh, because they didn't keep a player, uh, uh, an African-American player, on a team that could not play. One player that epitomized the decade was Jim Brown. He played like a superhero on the field, but off it, he simply demanded to be treated like a man. Brown chose to speak out against such customs as separating players by color in hotels, even if it cost him fans who preferred their heroes strong but silent. You have to have the patience of understanding that at the time you will be ostracized, but as history uh, moves into it, people will see that what you said made all the sense in the world. You know, you have to have the courage to deal from that position. Brown's words resonated in the minds of black athletes. Here we are performing in front of these people. They go out and pay a lot of money, uh, but yet they don't want to see you any place but on that field. You're out there and perform like gladiators, but uh, we don't want to. We don't want to see you. We don't want you close to us. Like autumn leaves, the autumn game was changing color. Pro football didn't always keep up. When we went to the game for the championship in uh, either, yeah, Houston, my family went in and sat on the 50 or 49 yard line. Uh, Charlie McNeil, co-captain's family, had to sit in the end zone behind ropes. I think you have to understand sport as a component institution of society. If you think about it in isolation, if you think about it as uh, the Tar Department of Human Affairs, utterly unrelated to what's happening in the mainstream, to what's happening in the world that's important, you fail to understand it at all. Sport in the 1960s was going through the same transition as society. Authority in the family was being challenged by the children. Authority in school was being challenged by the students. Authority in the workplace was being, was being challenged by the workers. Authority in sports was being challenged by the athletes. We were supposed to play a, a all-star game in New Orleans. Upon getting to the uh, Hotel Ro Roosevelt, I checked in 
At the time that I'm talking to the guy at the, at the desk there, I hear in the background um, people talking. Well, somebody asked a question, well, was that Ernie Ladd? And another guy in the background says, uh, no, Ernie Ladd's a bigger nigga than that. That's, that lad is a big nigga. So we decide we're going to visit the French Quarter, five, six black guys. We walk up to a club door, and they would get quiet, indicating, no, you don't come in. So we walked past four or five different clubs, couldn't get, any, get access to any of them. Uh, one guy yelled out, you, you, you so-and-so-and-sos get off the street. John F. Kennedy is not playing in here tonight. We walk up to that next club. This little guy standing there pulls out a gun. You are not coming in here. You niggas are not coming in here. We recoil, jump back. Ernie Ladd jumps forward. The guy puts the gun at Ernie Ladd's nose. Uh, I, I will pull the trigger. But the second day we were there, we got on the bus, and the bus was like a third empty. And whoever was our coach said, where is everybody? And, and somebody said, none of the black players are here. They're all in, they're all in a meeting. They're, they, they, they may not play in the game. And so uh, I got off the bus and went to the meeting. And I remember they were all in the room, and, and, and I'm thinking that I wanted them to be liked. And I didn't want them to do anything that would cause them to be disliked. And I think, well, the best thing to do is if we stayed and played and called attention to what is going on here, then their teammates, you see, would like them. But I didn't see the bigger picture importance of taking a stand. But they told me what had happened. And uh, I said, well, if you're not going to do that, he said, uh, I'll join the boycott with you. And the game was moved to Houston. And it wasn't long after that that legislation passed uh, in Louisiana, in New Orleans, because they wanted an NFL franchise. I think that was a shot that was heard across the bow of professional sports, that uh, players finally uh, were taking action on behalf of uh, the idea that we were a team. And you can't separate a team in hotels or restaurants or movies or certainly not in the huddle. Pro football's heroes often seem larger than life. The AFL All-Stars of 1964 remind us that they were nothing more than men, and definitely nothing less. I did not feel that it was a brave thing to do. I did not think about the social value involved in it in late, for later years. None of that entered into my mind. My, my, my personal reaction was that I, as a black man, I cannot go through this indignity and play a game here. Get exclusive features and real-time scoring free at NFL.com. African Americans in the AFL force changes in the NFL. Now on Black Star Rising. If the 60s were a cauldron of change, in pro football, it was also a crucible of talent. NFL stars like Gail Sayers, the Colts' Lenny Moore, and Willie Davis of the Packers lit up the sky. And nowhere else were opportunities brighter than when the young American Football League began playing in 1960. There's no question that the American Football League and at a more fundamental level, competition opened things up for African Americans. I think it was a representation of uh, promise. Uh, it's, uh, there was hope there. And uh, I didn't know, it was just a big gamble. But it was a gamble that many players, coaches, and owners took. They presented a style of play dramatically different from the traditional NFL. I think it would have been uh, utterly foolish for the uh, AFL to come out and try to play the same brand of football that the uh, NFL was playing at the time. The dull, conservative, tackle to tackle, run the ball here, run the ball there, occasionally pop up. 
Went cover seven. Second time he is 40. Still went cover seven. I haven't seen any strong coverage yet. We just decided people wanted to see you throw the ball. They didn't give a damn who caught it, but they wanted to see you to throw it. We felt that to uh, interest the fans, we had to put it up. It scored quicker. Uh, it rang that cash register, and that's what, what we were interested in. Fans caught on. Um, it put a premium on speed. People were going for speed instead of necessarily size. And now, pro football, uh, which has a majority of black players, is primarily a speed game. And Paul Brown said it a long time ago. I mean, he made him write it down in their notebooks. You can't lick speed. And so it was a springboard to modern football. First thing they did was went out and got good quarterbacks. Then they went out and got guys who could go get the ball for the quarterbacks, who could catch it. And they started raiding a lot of the black schools. They found out there was a lot of speed there, both offensively and defensively. We wanted to win. We wanted the best players. And in order to establish yourself, it had to have quality ball players. And they found a uh, field of diamonds, as it's called, of, uh, where there were just a ton of good ball players in the smaller black schools. That field of diamonds included top performers like the Raiders' Art Shell and number 24, Willie Brown. Ernie Ladd of the Chargers, as well as Otis Taylor, Buck Buchanan, Emmett Thomas, and Willie Lanier of the Chiefs. And by the end of the decade, those Chiefs were the first team whose roster was more than half black. What it really meant to me was that Kansas City was committed to winning. They were also world champions of Super Bowl IV. 65 toss power trap. 65 toss power trap. That might pop wide open, Rats. And Scram had a commitment to win. Scram was not trying to maintain something that one would say today might be thought of political correct back then in terms of the, the number of minorities that you would have on the team. But he was allowing the talent that could perform to play. 65 toss power and trap, yeah! And I was very proud of the organization for really taking that kind of position because for anyone who's grown up in a segregated society and you always question whether the opportunity is really real or whether it's something that's just said and it was not just Kansas City, it was throughout the American Football League that you saw a lot of black talent having a chance to play. And I think that probably helped the entire league because it allowed other teams to see the same thing occur. The feeling of victory that the 69 Chiefs celebrated was uniquely their own. But when individual self-expression resonates from a cultural base, it can become universal. In the 1960s, a New York Giant receiver named Homer Jones gave self-expression an entirely new dimension. Homer Jones spiked the ball. And so you have a situation where a black individual has paid the price and has achieved success. But when that success is achieved, they find that the vehicles of expressing how they feel about that are insufficient, and so they begin to innovate. And so when you see this continual creativity coming from black athletes, the high fives, spiking the ball, dancing in the end zone, what you are witnessing is the creation of a vehicle to express that joy for which there is no mainstream language. For that black athlete, the next challenge was participating in leadership on the field. Mom, how many times you... ...on one black star rising, taking control of the game. We saw it evolve over and over and over to the point that uh, as we got into the 70s, it really took off in favor of the black guys and began to bring them more on the same level at positions. On offense, Hall of Fame running backs rewrote the record books. Tony Dorsett and O.J. Simpson eluded defenders, while Franco Harris and Earl Campbell simply ran them over.
and Walter Payton, who inherited the legacy of Jim Brown, surged out in front of everyone. Walter Payton becomes the National Football League all-time leading rusher surpassing Jim Brown, and that's the equivalent to Hank Aaron breaking Babe Ruth's all-time home run record. The earlier promise of the AFL took full flight as receivers opened up the game with their aerial artistry. Defense, opponents shuddered at the mention of Dallas's doomsday defense, Chicago's Monsters of the Midway, and Pittsburgh's Steel Curtain. But the question of placing black players at key leadership positions had impacted many earlier careers. The positions that blacks were consigned to tended to be positions which were not central. That is, not central to the control of the outcome of a game. The thinking positions, the inside linebacker, those who were going to do the play calling were traditionally white. Those who were the more physical, the more skilled, the more instinctive players were black. You were told pretty well point blank. Uh, you couldn't play quarterback. You couldn't play center. You couldn't play linebacker. You couldn't play defensive safety. <laughs> it was kind of laid out. Those positions, you can't play those positions because supposedly you had to have uh, great intelligence. And, uh, but I think some guys have shattered that through the years. The breakdown came because someone went out and did it. I mean, Willie Lanier went out and did it. The stereotype was removed. You didn't get that. <laughs> As the first dominant black middle linebacker, Willie Lanier took a cerebral approach to the game. It was to a point that you could really play the game in your head before the game. You could play the game mentally, but all within the confine of the control of the angles because that was the thing that would make the difference. Lanier also blazed a trail for later linebackers that redefined their positions, like the Bears' Mike Singletary on the inside. Lift him up! If it flop over there and Sterling Sharp is on the inside guy, you got to be on it. And Lawrence Taylor of the Giants on the outside. Son, I got to do better than this. For years, the fraternity of black offensive linemen had few members. And we used to say, well, we can have a convention of the, the black offensive linemen in a phone booth, which just wasn't that many of us doing it. And uh, we had an opportunity to play, and when we did, we played well. You know, you take Larry Little, you take Art Shell, you take Bob Brown, and they've done it pretty well. Watch the stunts, watch the stunts. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's sort of nice when you turn the corner and you look into that defensive back's face and he looks a little frightened because he's got 260 pounds running at him and he don't know which way to go. Those giant men of the offense cleared the way for others, like Miami center Dwight Stevenson, as well as the Cowboys line of today. And leadership from defensive backs like Mel Renfro Mike Hayes, Mel Blunt, and Ronnie Lott broke the game wide open. Everett puts it on his hip, throws for the long one. He's got a receiver. Anderson and Ronnie Lott got there just in the nick of time. What a play by Lott. But the glare from the hottest spotlight in professional football is always on the quarterback. In the 1970s, Denver's Marlon Briscoe Joe Gilliam of the Steelers and the Rams' James Harris lit the way for others. There really weren't a lot of quarterback role models for me to look at uh, way back in the, in the early 70s, but James Harris was uh, somebody I really idolized uh, because he was a quarterback of the Los Angeles Rams. I grew up in Los Angeles, so that was the team I followed. The success of Warren Moon, the Eagles' Randall Cunningham, and today's rising stars, Steve McNair, and Jeff Blake can be traced to those pioneers. Stroke, stroke. Well, Cincinnati looking for a touchdown all afternoon would do well to cash in here. Blake looks, throws deep down the yes. middle. It is Scott. He's got it. He's in the end zone. Touchdown, Cincinnati. Right for the juggler. And clearly, no one blazed a brighter path.
Metcalf than Doug Williams in Super Bowl 22. Super Bowl MVP, Doug Williams of the Washington Redskins. First black quarterback to start a Super Bowl, the first black quarterback to win a Super Bowl. I hope he puts to bed once and for all about the black athlete in professional football. The Super Bowl as the backdrop and Williams as its star. The debate about black players' leadership abilities was settled at center stage. It had been a debate as old as professional football. That was another thing, another uh, stigma that we had to get over that, you know, a black quarterback couldn't lead his team to a championship. And Doug dispelled all that, doing it in such a fashion where um, there was no question that he was the best player on the field that day. This is what we were saying in the very beginning. Give us an opportunity and we can do anything. He's got Clark at the goal line. He's got it. Touchdown, Washington Redskins. We almost had tears in our eyes watching this superior performance by an unbelievably fantastic athlete. He's got Sanders in the clear at the 10. Touchdown. That's something we knew could have happened 10, 50, when football first started. We could have been doing that. Holy cow! It's 34 points in this quarter. Preview the World Thoroughbred Championships, Friday on ESPN2. In the history of the NFL, the leadership and personality of teams have ultimately been defined by their head coaches. And that was the standard of measure in 1989, when Art Shell was named head coach of the Raiders by Al Davis. He said, but I want you to know one thing. I'm not hiring you because you're black. You are a Raider. And that's very important to me. You're a Raider. Shell, number 78, had been a Hall of Fame tackle for the team. Then, as head coach, he drew from the lessons of his playing days and rekindled the Raiders' fiery silver and black style of football. One thing that you've done all year long, you've hung in there for six minutes and you got it done some kind of way. That's the mark of a true champion. In 1990, the Raiders regained their division title for the first time in five years. They did not, however, return to their Super Bowl glory days. After six seasons as head coach, Art Shell was released. In 1992, Dennis Green became the head coach of the Minnesota Vikings. He has captured the NFC Central Division title twice during his tenure. The thing that I found out about him more so after I got here was was his tenacity, the the, um, the type of intensity that he has as a person. I'm gonna tell you something, man. Only babies get what they want all the time. Men gotta do it the hard way. And we got nothing but men in this room. His identity is not of necessarily a black coach or whatever, but just a winner. He's been in some winning situations, and that's what gets the people to believe in him. I don't really think there's any larger message. Uh, this is what we do for a living. You better throw it, coach. Don't just, don't just drag slant again. Gotta get it. Bottom line is, is my job is to coach all the players with the Minnesota Vikings, whether they're black or white, and my job is to get the team to win. And if I don't do that, there won't be any social message at all. And that's where we all want to get. Martin Luther King Jr. once said, um, you want to look at the content of people's character. Pressure now. Throws it. It is tipped. In. in terms of football, you want to look at them with respect to their coaching ability or their performing on the field ability or their management skills. That's what's important. In 1995, Ray Rhodes took over a Philadelphia Eagles squad that wasn't supposed to go anywhere. It gets worse. You didn't think it could happen, but it just got worse. By the end of the year, the team was a stunning playoff winner. And in his rookie season, Ray Rhodes was named NFL Coach of the Year. He did it with faith in his system and a fire in his gut. 
he's got something inside that a lot of coaches are afraid to, to use, you know? And maybe he's got something inside that other coaches don't have. Kept fighting, man. That's the thing I, I enjoy. We kept fighting. Took it in overtime. Still fighting, man. We're finding a way to win. That's what the change is about. We got to find a way to win every week. Rhodes won 10 regular season games with a team that was outscored by its opponents. With a quarterback that threw just eight touchdown passes all season. And in the 1995 season's most spectacular upset, the Eagles stared down the Dallas Cowboys. Here's the ball game. Eagles would win it if they stopped the Cowboys here. They stop them again! They stop them again! With Ray Rhodes in charge, the Eagles always had a fighting chance. I joke him about it on occasions where I said, Ray, if a fight broke out and the, the bench is cleared, could you take that coach? <laughs> Ray believes he could be that coach, but hey, Ray believes he could beat anybody. In 1996, the roll call continued when Tony Dungy was named head coach at Tampa Bay. Well, when I first started playing, when I my first year in Pittsburgh, we didn't have a, a black coach on the staff. And slowly but surely, I think as uh, younger head coaches got involved, then you, you got more and more. And so it's, it's been a steady climb, and, and we've had more uh, blacks able to get in at entry level, more guys move up, and, and that's been positive. Guys went to school with each other, guys played pro football with each other, guys coached with each other, you know, and so I think any barriers that were there uh, are, are probably not going to be there much longer. We now return to Black Star Rising. In 19 a history that continues to write itself, there are other challenges and opportunities for African Americans. The business of football is far more than what goes on between the yard markers. And if uh, people of color are to succeed in football, to have a fair share of the opportunity that football provides, uh, it's got to come um, beyond the playing field. And when that happens, I think then we can say that the game has been beneficial to African American people. But uh, to the end that we don't have equal opportunity throughout the game, uh, we are overrepresented, if you will, uh, on the playing field and still underrepresented off the field. I don't think we, we uh, should just mandate certain things just because we are black Americans. I think what we should do is just be given that opportunity to succeed, and I think we'll do fine. We've proven that. Since 1983, Gene Upshaw has served as the executive director of the NFL Players Association. The thing that satisfied me is to see players have an opportunity to have some control over their lives, to decide who they play for, to decide if they want to retire, play one more year, or just walk away from it. How you doing? I think that's something that they deserve. Now the players have certain rights that uh, they never had before. In 1991, Harold Henderson became the highest ranking African American at the league office. We want to get those people on board, get those selected and get them on board right away. Uh, I think there's been real progress in terms of the number of minorities that are now moving into what you'd call high level office positions. I think that that again is a reflection of the success of the minority players on the field and the numbers that are on the field. Uh, and I think it's only natural that leaders would, would rise uh, out of that group. And I think that we are reaching that point. I don't think we're there yet. It's not a perfect world. In society, we're not there yet. But uh, as much as we are in the rest of our society, I think we are in football. One effort that Henderson oversees is the Minority Coaching Fellowship Program. In a nutshell, it's a program to bring college coaches in to work with the clubs as coaches during the training camp period before their college season start. And I guess the biggest measure of success is the fact that we've had 30-some-odd uh, coaches now hired from the ranks of the minority fellowship. People who got their first exposure to the NFL through this program are now permanent full-time employees of the football clubs. Gene Washington. As director of football development, 
Gene Washington's most visible role involves the on-field conduct of players. Uh, I thought it would be easy to look at a play and determine if a player had done something uh, over and above what he needed to do uh, uh, and to uh, decide if that player should be fined or not. It's not that easy. It, it's very difficult. And then when you finally make a decision and you say a player should be fined and he gets that letter and he says he's been fined for $12,000, he's a little upset about it. To be quite honest with you, I very rarely think about the fact that I'm an African American in this position. Uh, it hardly ever is a part of my conscious mind. But I think being an African American former football player, that that certainly gives me some advantages in terms of dealing with our constituency. African Americans first became part of franchise ownership in 1967. In 1993, Duran Cherry became the first black player to become part owner of an NFL franchise, the Jacksonville Jaguars. There's not really one person involved in our ownership group that has played the game of football, has been around the game of football. So I know what the players go through, what's, what's on their mind. Uh, you know, they can look at me and say, God, I remember when he played for the Kansas City Chiefs. I remember how he played the game with that zeal and that passion. That same passion and zeal can be translated into these younger players that I see in the locker room when I walk in there and I, and I go up to them and, you know, wish them good luck in the game. All those things they know I've been through, and I think that brings a sense of credibility and a sense of respect to the ownership group when you have somebody who's in that position. Looking for the end zone with the wide receiver. Catch, big, touchdown! Jacksonville's administration includes Michael Hugh, who directs all of the football operations for the team. At your personnel, see if there's some people we want to pick up uh, that we want to be ready to hit on the 26th. It's special because it recognizes, I think, what our franchise does, is that we're the team of the 90s, and I think that we have the ability to sort of emulate what the future of professional sports is going to be as well. Free agency spending will be for 1996, looking at free agency and their, and their cap totals, okay? We have taken on new... Uh, issues uh, as expansion teams and I think trend-setting aspects the fact that we have uh, African-American ownership and uh, an African-American in my position I think is certainly ground-setting in the sense that it hasn't existed in the NFL and it will help to ease uh, concerns that people might have had of whether or not that can exist and as it has done for the black quarterback in the league I think hopefully allow people to go on and say that it's important to look for equal representation and ownership because teams are so important to the entire community and I think it really um, makes us look like the prototype organization as you go forward into the year 2000 and I think it's a standard or maybe setting the foundation for other things to come uh, with regard to diversity in the National Football League. Seven, it all starts at 6.30 Eastern with College Game Day, Thursday on ESPN2. I still believe that the future of the National Football League and the greatness of the National Football League is in its future, but we owe a lot to the past. of my success, success of the National Football League, the success of an athlete, black or white, to those type of pioneers that were able to go out and do it. We all are standing on a lot of people's shoulders. The players today are standing on a lot of people's shoulders, and we have to remember that. And just leave something there for someone else. It's not over. I mean, that's why they play every week. It's not over. They're going to play next year. They're going to play the year after that. So there's going to be some more history. And I, I want to see it be greater than, than yesterday. The NFL is online at www.nfl.com. For more, log on to ESPN.com. Coming up on NFL Tonight, the start of Week 7, just a day away with the Colts and Chiefs both trying to regain their winning ways. We'll take a look at some quarterbacks around the league that are in need of a little R-E-S-P-E-C-T. Run for the touchdown! Touchdown Miami! There's a gold rush again in San Francisco. Jeff Garcia joins us as the 49ers might just be panning for the playoffs. And the 40 seconds between plays may just be where most of the playing actually goes on. If I'm sitting there and a quarterback stares at me and I stare right back at him, 
Ooh, what, I mean, why, why am I looking at him? When they do the Coke race at our game with the you know, Coke, Diet Coke, Sprite, I pick a ship every week. I'm 2-0 right now, Daddy. <laughs> NFL Tonight is always the right choice. Next. Everybody, welcome.